it is 2.30 here and uh, very early in, in, in Paraguay and in Brazil and South America. So good morning, everyone. And um, good evening for whoever is <laughs> farther afield. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. This is um, a last seminar. Um, we only had two in the context of our Itaipu project. It's a, it's a cooperation, uh, a collaboration between the University of Edinburgh uh, Fundación Getulio Vargas and the, uni uh, the National University of Asunción. Uh, I just want to, because this is the, this is the last time we, we meet in the context of the project, which started at the beginning of the year, the project really sought to um, explore and map the, the negotiations of the Itaipu project to get a better understanding of who are the actors, what the strategies might be, what are the interests, what is at the stake, and for us to understand better what the treaty is about and what are the expectations from Paraguay and from Brazil, both. Uh, in that context, uh, we had a really nice group of, of, um, of colleagues uh, from Edinburgh. Uh, it really started with, uh, with the inspiration of Veronica Ruiz and Professor Soledad Garcia. I don't know if she's here, and then Casey McCullough Smith, Julia Calvert, Professor Sean Smith, and Noel uh, uh, joined us uh, from um, our compass in this exploration was really uh, the group of Professor uh, Victoria Auxilia from the University of, of our National of Asuncion um, with Eduardo Ortigosa and uh, Richard Rios, who really taught us so much about the financial basis of the, of the, of the Itaipu Treaty and Annex C. And then we had the really nice input from Brazil to understand the history, the part of the treaty, the nature of the treaty from Professor um, Michel Raton Sanchez, uh, Andre Correa, and uh, Marco Germano. So I would have to have to thank you very much, uh, Eduardo, Noel, and, and Marco for their fantastic help. They were our research assistants, but I've never seen people that are so committed, so hardworking, and so passionate about this topic. So uh, with that, um, I would like now to, to start our last, uh, our last webinar that wants to see again this negotiation of the treaty from the perspective of sovereignty, um, energy justice, um, and, and, and human rights and development. So I'm going to explain a little bit the format for today. Um, sorry, I'm admitting more people. Um, just once more for, uh, for whoever wants to join the, the webinar in, um, in Spanish, you can go to the bottom interpretation with a little world at the bottom on the right hand side and press Spanish or English. Okay, so the format of this of this seminar is going to be Cecilia Llamosas from the University of National of Asuncion and Sussex University uh, will uh, give us a talk for 20 minutes about her findings around the Treaty of Itaipu, how she is analyzing sovereignty what is the conceptual framework of um, energy justice and, and all around development and um, for Paraguay and for Brazil in the negotiations. And after that, um, Julia, Veronica and K Casey and myself are going to make comments around sovereignty, human rights, um, negotiation, uh, asymmetry of negotiations and, and development, if, if that is fine. And then we are going to open the floor for everyone to have a discussion, questions, and 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 exchange, really, that is the the, the purpose of this of these webinars. So, um, without further ado, if I haven't forgot anything, I will then uh, open the floor for Cecilia. Very welcome, Cecilia, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ana Maria, and and thanks all, thank you for joining um, this this morning. So um, I'll go straight to my presentation so that we can start talking about this very exciting topic. Um, I'm going to share, um, uh, I'd like to share the screen. Um, so just, oh, I just need the, uh, a short authorization to, to, to be able to do that. Um, but just to, to get going, so the purpose of my presentation is really to generate questions um, for our discussion about Annex C later on, and I'll, I'll try to do that based on the findings of my doctoral research, which I'm developing at the University of Sussex, which Ana Maria just mentioned. Um, and I'm having a, I'm taking a comparative look at transboundary hydropower dams all over the world and focusing specifically on the case of Itaipu 
and um, trying to, uh, to, to come up with useful implications for these debates, um, which might inform also the public debate in Paraguay about the revision of Annex C, Brazil and beyond, right? So not, not only in Paraguay, my, my objective is to, to have a broader understanding of what transboundary hydropower dams look like um, somewhere else in the world and how this might inform our debates. So um, before I can, I can share the screen, I'm just going to go ahead and, 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 and give you a short introduction. So not all of you might be aware of, of, what, of what Itaipu or what the Annex C means. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and say that um, the first thing that is notable about our case at hand is that Itaipu is a transboundary hydropower dam, which is in itself something which is spectacular. Um, so it is not only straddled across the border between two countries, um, but it, it also it sits in an, in, an, in an international stretch of the Paraná River, straddled across the, to the, the borders of two countries. Um, but it's also the, the largest generation facility in the world in terms of renewable hydropower, uh, renewable energy. So it is, uh, it is, it is a, a landmark plant in, the, in, in, in terms of, in, in, many, in, many, in many ways. Um, and it caters demand in both Brazil and Paraguay. So this is already something that is, um, that is noticeable and that, that, that really sets the tone. But it also generates um, revenues for the states based on the payment of royalties for the use of the hydropower potential, which is shared by, two, by the two countries. Um, so, so about the treaty, because, because the dam is located you know, in the middle or straddled across the border of two countries, obviously there was the need to sign an international treaty to, to, to get the dam built and then to get it operating. So um, the treaty was signed in 1973, and it basically establishes rules on, on at least four, four, um, four, four dimensions of the operation. So first, it declares the co-ownership of the, of the natural resources. Um, it then states the will of joint action to harness the, the hydropower potential. It creates a binational entity, um, and it establishes also rules for sharing the energy between the two countries. So the treaty has a main body and the three annexes and the economic and the financial considerations of the, that rule the, the governance of the, of, of the dam, the hydropower plant are, are included in Annex C. So we're talking about the Annex C today and we're talking about, we're, we're focusing on these economic and financial considerations because the project was debt financed. So from an initial deal of 3.5 billion approximately um, back in the days, um, uh, only a hundred million, a hundred million dollar were uh, paid in in capital. So almost 97% of what was needed to get the, the hydropower plant uh, up and running was, uh, was debt sourced. Now these debts will be paid off in 2023. And the effect of the paying off of these debts is that in a business as usual scenario, the costs um, the, and, and the tariff that, uh, at which Itaipu offers the energy to, to the public utilities in Paraguay and Brazil will go down or will plummet to 60% of its value. So this is the core, um, the, the, core, the core issue of what's going to happen about the version of Annex C. Um, now, um, besides this, 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 this uh, large framing, um, we have an issue with the, in, interpret, in terms of interpretation about the rules for sharing, which I just mentioned that are also part of the treaty. So the rules for sharing the energy um, stem basically from a principle of 50-50 sharing between Paraguay and Brazil. And uh, because from the outset, it was clear that um, not, I mean, that Paraguay and Brazil would not need the same amount of, of, of power from the, from the dam, um, there was, uh, there, there's uh, the right of purchase which was established in the body of the treaty. And this right of purchase states that, um, that only the public utilities um, from Brazil and Paraguay are um, have this have this right of purchase to, to, to acquire the production mm -hmm. of Itaipu. And tied to this right of purchase, the concept of the compensation fee, which basically states that um, if the if country A does not buy all of its share, then the other country is entitled to buy it in exchange for a compensation fee, which is payable to <clears throat> the other country. Sorry, so, yeah, you can share the screen yes. now. I oh yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, I'm just gonna pause then and try and share the whole 
<clears throat> the whole um, where we have it. So no, let me. Yeah, there we go. Please let me know if um, full screen is on. So can you see it? Oh, great. So as I was saying, um, um, so the rules for sharing, the key point of contention su surrounding the discussions of Annex C, at least in Paraguay, which I'm going to, uh, which I'm going to focus on today, is that the prevailing interpretation has been that neither country can dispose of part or all of its share to sell to third parties. Um, and this has been an issue um, in Paraguay, maybe more than in Brazil, um, because um, their needs and the capabilities in terms of the power that Itaipu offers um, were and remain asymmetrical uh, between Paraguay and Brazil. Um, just, as a, just to give an example, back when Itaipu, the Itaipu Treaty was signed, um, in Paraguay, only two in 10 people had access to electricity to the, to the network. And in Brazil, five in 10 already had this access. While, while Brazil already had the installed capacity, which was equivalent to one Itaipu, Paraguay had only the capacity, which was equivalent to one fourth of one of 20 turbines. So the, the, as I said, the, the needs and the capabilities were and remain asymmetrical. So this has been a key point of contention that surround the discussions uh, surrounding revision of Annex C um, and now and then. So besides this, this, um, besides this, this uh, strict description of what the issue at hand is, um, the importance of Itaipu or the event of the revision of Annex C goes beyond the four corners of the Annex C or beyond the four corners of the treaty even. And in Paraguay, this has been showcased um, in the public debates with, uh, with two discursive frames which have dominated the discussions. And I'm just gonna give you now an, an overview of what these two, frame, these two discursive frames look like and what they highlight. So just before going into that, just to set the stage for those of you which, who might not be familiar with, with what the issues are in Paraguay. So Paraguay obviously has a large surplus of hydropower um, and the mainstream discussions in Paraguay about the revision of Annex C and about hydropower and its surplus are framed around the freedom to sell to others. So of the surplus being offered to third parties. However, Paraguay lags behind its peers and, and, and the regional in, in the region in terms of per capita use of electricity and also infrastructure deficit. So um, for me, the main, the, main, the, main, the main inspiration for this discussion is the fact that the revision of Annex C offers the opportunity to refocus the priorities of the discussion um, towards, uh, you know, a better, a better um, enjoyment of the of the benefits that such a transboundary hydropower might bring to Paraguay and to the region in, as a whole. And um, the way we frame this discussion will really determine which problems come to the fore and which problems get more attention at the moment that the revision uh, of Annex C is actually comes comes into play which will be at 2023 at the latest. So the two days discursive frames, which I just simplified to the maximum to, to be able to have a, a useful conversation about this and a more fluid conversation are um, on the one hand, the discursive frame of, of hydroelectric sovereignty. And on the other hand, a discursive frame, which, is, uh, which re revolves around the concept of energy for development. So the hydroelectric sovereignty frame um, basically um, states in a very succinct way, I, I put it this way, um, that sovereignty was essentially lost when the treaty was signed. And that sovereignty will be recovered once Paraguay gains free availability of its share of energy to sell to others at market price. Um, and energy for development is a discursive frame which gained traction in the last years, um, but which was already in the, in the, in the, in the discussions. And, Basically, it, it, it states that Paraguay should strive to use all of its energy within borders and that in the long term, the best strategy is to employ um, this surplus domestically to fuel an industri industrialization strategy. So these are the two prevailing discursive frames that kind of dominate the debate in Paraguay. And just to put it into context, so the hydroelectric sovereignty frame focuses on market opportunities beyond borders and the energy for development frame focuses on strategies for use within borders. Now, just to 
go back to the to the to the key to the key puzzle that we have in Paraguay is that this energy to be to be to be I mean for this energy to be distributed within borders we have the conundrum where we have a large surplus but we lag behind in terms of per capita use and infrastructure deficit. Um, so my main interest in pursuing the analysis of, of this um, the, of this topic was how can we how can we um, understand or how can we, how, how can we harness um, these these benefits for a better enjoyment not only within Paraguay but also beyond but where can we learn from or what can we learn about our experience of transboundary hydropower and uh, how can we inform this debate beyond the discursive frames which are already which are already circulating the public debate in Paraguay and here we have to highlight that there is a public debate of such a highly technical issue as a, as a hydropower plant and rules for sharing energy. So what I did and what I, what I'm, what I want to share with you um, is, the, is the development of a comparative analysis that I have conducted and, and a conceptual framework which I have come up with um, um, to look at the process of, 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 of the revision of Annex C and basically to inform this process based on the experience of other countries. So my first task was to ask, are there any transboundary, other transboundary hydropower dams at all that we can look at, for example, and, and to gather best practices? And the, and the answer was that I couldn't find this information anywhere. So I had to, I had to, to superimpose several databases and I came up, came up with, this, with this image that you see here, where I found that out of the 286 shared basins in the world, um, there are approximately 749 hydropower dams which sit in these transboundary basins. So about 49% of all the registered hydropower dams have transboundary or might have transboundary implication. So this was my first, um, my first um, finding. Now, what I did afterwards was to look at literature and see, okay, so we know there are trans other transboundary hydropower dams. Um, what is being written about this? And what can we learn that can, can inform the, the revision of Annex C? So what I found is um, by looking at, at, the, at the literature is I found 90 hydropower dams which were mentioned in, in, in the literature. And um, what I, I did is I, I kind of concentrated on looking for common, common, yeah. common patterns and common dynamics that could inform our, our debate. So I just chose some, some key findings here. So first is that asymmetrical exchanges are very commonplace because of the same nature of, of, of sharing and of cooperation. Um, that the size of the resources may in fact be incongruent with existing capabilities to absorb the benefits of those resources and that's also commonplace. And that beyond sovereignty over natural resources or issues of co-ownership, attention to the rules of the distribution of the ensuing benefits is actually the key to attaining more equitable distribution of the of the of the of the energy and and, and economic benefits that any transboundary dam can bring, and especially that issues of energy security, of capabilities and justice become as important in shaping conditions as do technology, infrastructure, and natural resources. Um, so after finding more finding out more about what what it looks like at a global scale, what I did is I develop um, a conceptual framework to look at uh, some cases in detail best based on the concept of energy justice, which I think is a concept which uh, really turns head in the sense that it sounds, it sounds very impressive. What, what are we talking about when we're talking about energy justice? And in fact, what we're talking about is, um, is, is a conceptual framework. It's a, it's a, it's a framework that, that can aid in reframing energy issues in the light of justice principles. Um, and uh, if we are looking for a concept of what energy justice is, it is basically a global energy system that fairly disseminates both the benefits and the costs of energy services, and one that contributes to more representative and impartial decision making. It is basically all about how access to modern energy systems and services is distributed throughout society. Um, but this concept, um, it, it hadn't been, been used in transboundary contexts before and in asymmetrical settings, even less. So what I did is I developed, um, I developed initially a, a, a draft um, conceptual framework to be able to understand 
the factors that I found about in the literature and which might be determinant in discussing the Itaipu, um, the Itaipu case and the Annex C. So just to go to, to walk you through this, this, this conceptual framework, in the middle, we have the main, um, the main feature of a hydropower plant, which is that it provides energy security. So it's built to provide energy. Um, so we have security of supply, security of demand, and security of energy services, which are at the center of any, any generation facility. But this cannot be absorbed by, by, by the partner countries in this case. Um, if there aren't sufficient technical, financial, and organizational factors in place to be able to absorb these benefits in a way that is meaningful. So um, in order for this to be, to be useful for a country, this has to be done in a way that is fair and equitable. Um, and of course, the, the, big, the big words here are transparency and accountability of the revenue management in order for these other dimensions to be, um, to, to be present in, in, in any country. So um, this framework really um, helped me look at three cases in more detail, which are uh, one of them is Paraguay, but also two other really representative cases, which provides also interesting insights to look to think about the revision of Annex C. And these are the 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 three the the the, the most representative findings that I that I found by looking at Laos, Bhutan, and Paraguay in comparative perspective, applying this framework, which I just showed you. Um, and it's basically that even when, when capabilities, meaning in capabilities, we mean the working capital, we mean the knowledge about how a, 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 a network is set and, and also the, the sufficient demand that is there to absorb that energy. So even when these capabilities may exist and the transboundary hydropower potential is realized, low diversification in terms that if we only rely on hydropower and if we only rely on a few generation plants, is a risk in terms that um, it might it might um, it might bring the country into a, a, a vicious loop where it cannot then develop and it, the, the 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 mechanisms to distribute the energy benefits fairly. Also, we know that um, integration, like wider wider schemes where more than one country is involved, are much better. Looking at the comparative li literature uh, in terms of opening doors for better economic deals. And that the revenue management of these of these hydropower plants are really key to um, to diminish the the asymmetrical or the asymmetries between the partner countries, you know, to to kind of creating a level playing field between the two, so that the benefits can be more equitably distributed, and that security beyond secure capacity, meaning we have a lot of we have a surplus, but we don't have um, energy for everyone for everything that people need. Uh, means really engaging seriously with energy services and a wise strategy to reinvest in human development. And also that ambitious targets in terms of investment, in terms of adding capacity, must really be tempered by the reality of the needs of the population, because otherwise we might pay too much for something that takes us too long to take advantage of. And this is, as I said, the findings of, of looking at Bhutan and looking at Laos, which are countries that have also vast experience in working in transboundary settings. <clears throat> so what does this imply for our discussion of, of the revision of Annex C? So first, um, and these are uh, my, my um, these are some of the key conclusions I came, I came up with. So first, in approaching the revision of Annex C, it is crucial to take stock of the performance of Paraguay in terms of security and capabilities informed by the principle of energy justice, uh, in the sense that we have availability, affordability, and transparency and accountability as key principles of this framework. Also that not all problems that Paraguay has can be solved by the, by the revision of Annex C per se, but the importance of this event as a, uh, in terms of what the national attention it brings can serve as, this, as a focusing event in Paraguay and in the region to put on the table other issues which might be important for the future of the, of the distribution of benefits. Also that um, concentrating, concentrating efforts in enabling increased use in Paraguay would maximize the position of the country as it would be the only way to effectively take sovereign control over its share of hydropower. But also that integration is a powerful source of benefits which has not been harnessed fully in, in South America and comparative research indicates that this is the better way to go. So we have three shared transboundary hydropowers in the region, 
but we do not have wider integration strategies that come into play. So we have this isolated um, integration foci, but we do not have, we, they, they are not even interconnected um, among, among each other. So based on, this, uh, on these conclusions, I, I, want to present, uh, I want to present some emerging questions for our discussions in which I'd like to, to offer as, as impulses um, to, to think about this in terms of justice, in, to think about this in terms of sovereignty. Um, questions that, that are, that some of them might be even naive, but I'd like to, to know your take on that. And first is on the face of abundance, how justly are the benefits of such a huge endowment distributed, both within Paraguay and within Brazil? And um, why are the citizens of Paraguay and Brazil using so little of these of this benefits? And can a justice perspective aid in mapping out the needed investments or the steps towards a more complete enjoyment of benefits? And does reframing the discussion in terms of justice help us focus on the beneficiary and not the territory? And what are the implications of this discussion for wider integration strategies? Um, these are the, the first questions I'd like, to, I'd like to, to kickstart our discussion with. And, and then I have a second set of questions, but I think with this, we have more than enough. And also I'd like to hear um, what our colleague from the University of Edinburgh um, can, can, can tell us about what they think about with, what, what we just talked in this chat. So, so thanks for listening and, and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Cecilia. It was a fascinating presentation and so clear as well that you present such a complex complex issue in in a in a in a way that is accessible and clear for everyone. Um, many many people have joined, so just let me welcome everyone and uh, explain. Well, Cecilia has just presented these uh, around twenty minutes, and uh, I'm going to next um, address the issue from the perspective of sovereignty um, in general, uh, and then Julia is going to speak about asymmetry of uh, asymmetry of powers and negotiation. Uh, Casey, per, uh, human rights perspective, and then uh, Veronica, uh, sustainable development goals. So this is just to to re um, <laughs> repeat what we have said at the beginning, but for you to know what uh, what we are at. So um, I found I find always the the discussion and the notion of sovereignty uh, extremely interesting, but extremely complicated, right? Uh, the S word, as Henkin call it. Uh, has so many different uh, significations and, and meanings. It's a limitation, but at the same time, time allows to do something. Um, and, and, and the way perhaps I understand sovereignty first as an inherent power of each state to do something. So because you are exercising your sovereignty, you sign a treaty, may it be uh, disadvantages to you or not, and, and of course that that responds to other historical contexts that are very important. I think Julia uh, is very placed to discuss them, you know, from the perspective of international relations. But um, one of my thoughts were when you talk, I found it very interesting to see this uh, this division of of um, on one hand um, hydro sovereignty or hydro uh, hydroelectricity sovereignty and uh, energy for development as you know as two separate or two possible exclusive um understanding of the negotiation or revision of the treaty i in my view i think that both require exercise of sovereignty they both are sovereignty in themselves if i may um energy for development requires um, um you know even if it's only for the revision of annex c will require the exercise of sovereignty perhaps in a more nuanced way in a more cooperative way, but it's still um, the the recovery of sovereignty to to an extent, in, in, in respectfully. Um, so I don't know if they can be comparable. I think they probably are, you know, part of one range of of, of the exercise of sovereignty. They can be more to perhaps less less uh, aggressive in 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 the sense of negotiations. Uh, that from one perspective. Um, but then um, I would understand in this case sovereignty in the in the context of the treaty as a qualification. Can we qualify sovereignty? And I think for that um, the notion seems to continue developing, and we want to address these nuanced expressions of it, perhaps not seen as a separation of states, but as a supranational uh, value or as a transnational value. So my uh, my take on this 
in, in, in this sense is first, I could understand sovereignty in the, in the context of the treaty in two times, say. First, the time of managing shared waters, that was perhaps what triggered the, 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 the conclusion of the treaty in the 70s, uh, a problem of limitation of the, of the river Paraná and all that. So the, from that perspective, you have a shared sovereignty um, a perspective of Brazil and Paraguay as co-owners of the dam and the, and the shared waters and a responsibility for the protection of the shared waters and, uh, and uh, you know, an obligation of no harm, perhaps consultation with um, downstream states such as, as Argentina. Also a responsibility in connection to development, the protection of the environment and nowadays uh, the big challenge of climate change. So from that perspective of shared waters, and I will say that first step, I find that a shared sovereignty of the resource and very much a cooperation um, from that, uh, of also a cooperation to protect the, the whole um, La Plata basin. A second um, notion of sovereignty or second perspective on sovereignty, I, I understand it from the perspective of the of, of generation of electricity and sharing of the benefits, a more individual perspective of sovereignty, uh, because the parties in this case becomes uh, the parties become partners in a sort of joint venture through a binational uh, international organization that is Itaipu bin, uh, binational or binacional. So it's more of a commercial relationship that includes debt, that includes trade. Uh, that include regulation um, and share of benefits. So it's more of a business. And I think these two coexist because there are still obligations that, move, uh, that are relevant to the past. Um, and I think that is, that is something that I think should be considered um, in your, in, uh, could be considered in your work. It is simply as a suggestion. Um, but I think that bo both, both notions are important to be considered. Now, with regard to your conceptual framework of, of energy justice, I also find it fascinating. And, and, and I think it, you know, when you hear about it, 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 sounds, um, it sounds very, um, very unclear. What is, what is um, energy justice? It's such a, it's such a nuanced concept. But uh, I understand now what, what is that you seek with it and, and what is the notion that you, that you defend. And, and I find energy justice, uh, could work as a retrospective, um, as a retrospective analysis of, of backward looking. When you say reframe, um, you know the treaties or the conditions of the treaty or the or the the rules under which we are going to share the resources and we are going to benefit from the tariff or or, or sell our energy and all that seems to be you know uh, reassessing uh, possible injustices or you know just asymmetries in this case, that on one hand. Um, so I would say that, and from that perspective, I would say that because I, I, I know, I know much less than any of you here of the treaty with Cecilia and, 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 and colleagues, but you know, there has been some reassessment of for him, for example, in the, I think the, two, the, the uh, 2000s, a calculation of the compensation that Brazil and Paraguay negotiated the dollarization of the debt uh, in the in the nineties, I think, um, a schedule of the of the expected demand of electricity as well. You know, from from twenty years to ten years to make it more realistic and more possible for both countries to to present information. Um, and that is my take on 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 the on energy justice. Now, a second qualification that I would suggest, and I have had not enough time to to uh, explore it more, but I, I really like it when I heard recently a talk about it, and I thought this could be interesting for you, is consider it from the perspective of a forward-looking approach that would be solidarity. Now, solidarity is a concept and a notion that is being very much used recently uh, in international law. Perhaps it can be analyzed from the perspective of the duty no, under international law, the duty to cooperate, and this duty to cooperate covers the responsibility of human rights, which uh, case is going to to discuss development and many others, but also the the the, 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 the 
the duties, the legal duties as such, and moral duties as such. So I think I, I understand solidarity from that perspective. And I like it because um, I recently heard uh, Professor Mebenge from, from Geneva to talk solidarity in the context, of, the context of the global crisis. What he said was solidarity is perhaps the ultimate way to transcend the clash or the potential class, clashes between national sovereignty and international cooperation. It is the compass that can build bridges between these two concepts. And, and I think in the case of Brazil or Paraguay, it engloses this, this whole thing, cooperation among themselves, uh, ref reframing the treaty, if you want, whether it is a, a renegotiation of certain parts of the treaty or only the negotiation of annex, on Annex C, uh, but also con connects to global challenges such as climate change. Because this big region, I think, is, is important for everyone, not only the basin itself, but is very close to it, the Amazon and, and, and all the, you know, for all the region. So with that, I would, I would conclude my participation. Thank you very much. I give the floor to Julia then. Hi. Um, as Anna Maria said, I'm a political scientist. I'm based in an international relations department, a politics and international relations department. So I'm interested in issues of power. Um, uh, between the parties in the context of the negotiations and the negotiating outcomes. Um, my presentation is going to pick up a little bit on um, um, what, what Anna Maria said about um, the frames being a little bit perhaps more complementary than oppositional. Um, for a sort of a rela relational approach to understanding Paraguay's um, positionality within the context of these negotiations coming up on, um, on these sort of financial details. And then I wanna talk a little bit about um, uh, bargaining power as a concept and how we might relate it to energy justice and perhaps thinking about some of these issues of solidarity that Anna Maria has mentioned as well. So, um, so two points that I really want to make is, is that um, it's important to recognize how interrelated this position of historic sovereignty is, uh, sorry, electric um, uh, sovereignty is with energy for development. Um, if not uh, politically, then intellectually, because I think politically these, these two frames um, reflect different kinds of interests, perhaps that are not necessarily so easy to, um, to bring together. Um, but I think that there's an, in, uh, an important sort of intellectual productive friction that we need to sort of exploit if we're going to enhance Paraguay's um, bargaining power within the, um, uh, within the context of the upcoming negotiations. The second point I wanna make is that um, adopting an energy justice approach needs to, to also take account of, um, of positionality and, and um, relationalism in, uh, in, in it, it needs to be a, a more relational approach perhaps than, than just looking at uh, what's fair and what's just for Paraguay. And I think um, by applying uh, the framework of energy justice <laughs> relationally, sorry, my daughter's just coming into the room. <laughs> um, uh, we, can, we can also enhance Paraguay's um, bargaining power. So, so I'm going to put both of those points into conversation with, uh, with um, power um, uh, historically that's influenced the negotiating outcomes and, and um, hopefully what, what's um, to move forward. Uh, okay, so the first thing I want to say when I think when I say these frames are not necessarily oppositional um, hydroelectric sovereignty and energy for development, um, I, I, I'm not advocating for for sort of blending these projects together, that they, that they um, sort of exist in this harmony. As I said, they're politically diverse, I think, um, in the voices that are advocating for them and the interests that they represent. Um, and I think that it's important to have this debate between these different frames. So don't bring these frames together, keep them separate, but keep the debate, um, uh, think about how, how the debate between them can be productive. Um, Intellectually speaking, okay, so intellectually speaking, um, of course, they're, they're very different in that the hydroelectric sovereignty approach is um, a little bit more, it, it historicizes the Isaku project a little bit more than the energy for development, which seems to be a little bit ahistorical 
in that advocates of the energy development, uh, energy for development approach seem to think about, you know, what can we do with the, the revenue or the treaty negotiations moving forward, whereas the hydroelectric sovereignty approach explicitly situates the E-Typhoon project within Brazil's, uh, Brazil, <laughs> Paraguay's, um, colonial past and present, recognizing the ways in which this project is linked to historical struggles over the foreign ownership of, of natural resources within Latin America, but also in Paraguay. Um, indigenous subjugation and Paraguay's complicated relationship with Brazil. The concept of hydroelectric sovereignty also is underwritten, I think, by an explicit and implicit uh, concern for democracy insofar as it emphasizes Paraguay's right to self-determination, particularly over the governance of its own natural resources. It also seeks to enhance the voice of Paraguayans in decision-making concerning the dam's operations, revenue, and governance. Um, and it's also, I think, uh, developed in, in, in an explicit sort of rejection of, of Paraguay's own political past and the dominance of sort of elite driven interests. Those kinds of, that, that kind of um, historical understanding or, or sort of context is not necessarily evident in the um, energy for development approach. And so that's perhaps where these two, um, these two approaches or these two frames kind of butt heads where they conflict. Um, intellectually, though, as Anna Maria said, I think that um, they complement one another in, um, in, with respect to the theme of sovereignty, because they're both pointing to the need for greater policy autonomy and policy space um, uh, within Paraguay to decide over um, what, what the benefits of, this, of, of its share of the, um, of the revenue or the operations of the stamp are going to be um, before we talk about how energy can be used for development, how, how revenue can be used for development. We need to address, I think, some of the more foundational issues that um, the advocates of a hydroelectric sovereignty approach, that's a mouthful, <laughs> um, point to. And, and, and there are profound um, uh, sources of inequality within the context of this, um, the financial annex that I think need to be addressed before we can really have productive conversations about how to use the energy uh, for development, because it's not just about it's not just about um, funding health and social programs. That could that's one option. That's one policy idea. But there's lots of other policy ideas. Um, Cecilia, in in her other work, has has very well um, made a point about funding uh, the need for an energy transition within Paraguay. Um, and I think that to to have that debate is sort of um, we need to address some of these some of the more foundational problems that problems, issues, I'll frame it as that, uh, that the hydroelectric sovereignty camp is sort of pointing to. Um, so, so there's some important issues, as Cecilia's mentioned, that's reduced um, Paraguay's policy space um, to have this conversation about what to do moving forward. So Brazil's, um, I, I call it a first serve advantage, um, Cecilia has called it the right of purchase. Um, and uh, so the fact that Brazil gets the right to, um, to this electricity, uh, the fact that um, there's been a sort of stable compensation fee integrated into this treaty um, uh, that is historically has been quite below market price and also the lack of infrastructure within Paraguay to decide how to use um, the electricity itself uh, domestically and, and um, if, it, if it chooses to do so. Um, and, and so these sources of inequality makes, makes um, me wonder as a political scientist, so how, where did these, um, how, how were these negotiating outcomes? What, what were the power asymmetries between the camps that um, led to these kinds of outcomes in the first place? And one of the things I think about, of course, um, we could take a more sort of static IR approach and think about market size. Brazil is just a much bigger country um, market size. And there could have been other commercial interests um, that Paraguay was thinking about when it agreed to these negotiations. We could think about military strength. Um, this is sort of a realist, sort of liberal institutionalist approach that I'm taking. Um, we could also think a little bit about um, political interests on the Paraguayan side, perhaps um, when it was thinking about what to do with revenue, um, it was more interested in, in elite short-term interests as opposed to long-term development planning. Um, but we can also think about the techno-scientific knowledge that it takes to really develop a strong bargaining position. Um, 
when uh, when Brazil is thinking about uh, when the two parties are thinking about negotiating um, a sort of static compensation fee that um, might retain prices below market, that takes a sort of um, an understanding of market prices might rise in the next couple of decades. Um, and the, that kind of issue reflects the need to, at least in developing a strong bargaining position, to think about um, the kinds of technical and scientific knowledge that uh, a country needs to um, put behind its own negotiating platform uh, when, when approaching these kinds of negotiations. Um, the fact that Brazil secured for itself a right of purchase also speaks to an ability to think in the long term and also um, to think about what kinds of technical uh, the kinds of tech, it speaks to uh, perhaps a technical advantage that it um, possessed within the history of this, um, of the negotiation of this treaty. Um, when I'm thinking about, okay, so those are some of the sources that may have led to an unequal relationship within the financial annex of this treaty. When I'm, uh, so the question for me now is how have these um, disadvantages perhaps um, changed over time and is, Brazil, is Paraguay in a more advantageous position. Uh, one thing we can think about is the fact that regional integration in Latin America, um, although historically um, shaky in some respects, uh, has improved over time. Mercosur is, is a rather stable regional institution um, and has uh, faced hiccups um, rather successfully um, in the last few decades. Um, it exerts uh, a moral and I think a political authority over its member states. Um, and so this could be perhaps a source of advantage for Paraguay thinking um, coming up to uh, these negotiations in terms of if it wants to uh, revise some of these, perhaps uh, the sources of inequality within the financial annex. Um, one question is, can it rely on regional partners or regional institutions to exert a sort of moral um, authority in its favor over uh, these treaty negotiations? Um, it, is in, it's, it is within uh, the region's interest for Paraguay to secure uh, the ability to, to sell to third parties um, and at market prices, uh, given that other Latin American countries face an electricity shortage um, and also that this is a more sustainable source of electricity than what is currently used in neighboring countries. Um, how else has Paraguay's position changed um, in terms of bargaining power? Well, military force hopefully um, is, is uh, um, less of an option than it was uh, earlier on in, in this relationship. Um, we can also think a little bit about um, the, the, where the funding, where the capital came from. Brazil did fund most of this project um, in the earlier days, which gave it a sort of uh, more clout within, within the um, original treaty negotiations that has uh, changed or is about to change. Um, the project is no longer dependent on Brazilian funding. And so I think that uh, Paraguay, in a few respects, um, those are some examples, is in a better bargaining position. But, and going back to my, uh, to my earlier point about bringing these frames together, one of the things that threatens the um, Paraguayan bargaining position is, is um, these sort of distinct voices um, within Paraguay speaking past each other. Um, studies have shown that one of the most important things, especially for a country that uh, considers itself an underdog uh, in international treaty negotiations is um, the importance of developing a cohesive set of uh, negotiating objectives that's well informed and that has um, a political buy-in from various stakeholders. And so if we want to talk a little bit about how Paraguay can improve its bargaining position, it's um, about learning from both frames in terms of what needs to happen first and what needs to happen second or third, what kinds of concessions um, uh, Paraguay can afford to offer or will offer in order to see that these frames are sort of both best represented within its own negotiating position. Okay, um, I'm glad I didn't promise that I would be succinct because I'm being less succinct than I had intended. I'm going to skip on to my other point about um, energy justice um, in terms of the sort of potential for a more relational approach um, within this framework. 
uh, I think Cecilia has done um, an amazing job in terms of uh, developing a really what promises to be a really cohesive um, intellectual framework for looking at the various options facing Paraguay and, and other countries um, within uh, similar um, projects. What, um, and I think that she's done a, a lot of really important comparative work uh, that looks, that um, promises to develop some generalizable conclusions about what are fundamentally unequal power relations within these projects. Um, what I think about um, perhaps in applying um, energy justice and also um, thinking about the um, bargaining power is the fact that um, justice in itself, um, fairness itself and equality itself are fundamentally relational concepts. And they need to be understood in, in relation to the benefits and disadvantages um, of experienced by both parties. So can we understand what's most just for Paraguay without understanding what's um, most just or unjust for Brazil as well? Um, we can only understand what's equal um, if we take both parties' positions in, 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 um, into consideration. Um, pragmatically speaking, so there's a normative uh, element to that argument in that um, we can understand what's just for both sides, perhaps in, in reflecting, um, this speaks to Anna Maria's point um, on solidarity, but also pragmatically speaking, uh, within the context of negotiations, understanding um, what's how a more just approach for Paraguay implicates or impacts the um, different interests within Brazil uh, will strengthen Paraguay's own positionality within the bargaining, uh, within bargaining power, um, simply because they're, they're going to understand better what, what their demands, how their demands are likely to impact uh, Brazilian interests and what kind of um, room they have to maneuver in terms of the concessions that they might ask for. Um, so, so, to bring that sort of um, nebulous <laughs> point down to earth. Um, Paraguay faces an important challenge in that, and the fact that, um, that's the fact that Brazil is overwhelmingly more dependent on, on the energy produced from Itaipu than, than our Paraguayans. And that sort of speaks to perhaps the inequality in the relationship, but it's also um, perhaps uh, going to be a, a, a huge stumbling block in, within the negotiations. So Brazil's interests are of course going to be in keeping rates low and maintaining its advantage. Um, previous administrations did seem more sympathetic to the Paraguayan uh, position, but I think under the current uh, regime that's going to change, so there's probably less sympathy. Um, any concessions Paraguay is going to secure for itself in the upcoming negotiations, which um, secure its right to sell to third parties or at a market price will have adjustment costs on the Brazilian side. And um, applying for an energy justice approach would ask us to look at what one of these adjustment costs, not only for the Brazilian state, but also for Brazilian households, um, uh, workers, um, and social groups. Um, and keeping those kinds of adjustment costs in mind under an energy for justice framework might, under, might help Paraguay sort of buttress its position in terms of, if we think about what these adjustment costs are, how and why, uh, how Brazil might need to mitigate them. Um, Brazil, uh, Paraguay might, might think a little bit about what kinds of short-term concessions um, could be requested and offered as a means to drive toward a more long-term equitable arrangement. Um, Um, okay, so I'm going to leave, uh, leave my point there and hopefully we can uh, discuss that a little bit more in, in Q&A, but I think I've gone over a little time for now. So, so I'll leave it uh, to my next colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I think definitely we can discuss again the, the, the conceptual framework is from so many different perspectives. Uh, may I then give the floor to Casey then? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think what I'm going to do, so my name is Casey McCall-Smith and I'm a senior lecturer in public and international law at um, Edinburgh Law School and my focus has always been on uh, treaty law, um, but I also um, have a large interest in human rights and so my comments are kind of going to speak to the existence of kind of kind of global goods and global values that aren't necessarily um, reflected yet in the conversations, but thinking about the way in which history has developed and much of what um, 
uh, Julia spoke to, it was actually a very good prelude to what I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, and Cecilia set out a, a great explanation of the competing interests and the competing approaches. And, and, um, and then both of my colleagues have talked about how there might not necessarily be competing. Um, I guess there are various shades of gray um, that go to um, the potential approaches to renegotiating um, Annex C. Um, I think what's interesting for me is that in the interim time between the original treaty being negotiated and um, the renegotiation of the NXC in, in 2023, is that both Brazil and Paraguay have um, joined the global community in, at least in the context of kind of a more cosmopolitan vision of um, a global community in the context of human rights. And I think that that is important and it's increasingly important, um, particularly in this context, because the ITFU is so much associated with the concept of green energy and sustainable energy, which speaks very largely to sustainable development and the developmental goals of both countries. Now, when the treaty was originally negotiated and the whole project was negotiated, Brazil was no doubt in a much stronger position economically um, and uh, politically. And so the inequalities that may have existed then, um, though many of them still exist now, um, I think that the knowledge basis is much um, in a more even playing field and in intellectual energy that's being invested from both countries, I think is much more equitable now. And so I think that's something that we can't discount, particularly when we are talking about um, the fulfillment of so many aims and objectives that can come with renegotiation based on what financial provision eventually comes out of this treaty. And so I just want to talk a little bit about that and kind of expand kind of these idea about the global oriented obligations of both countries um, in the interim years. And so in that context, I think what's really relevant here um, are those human rights, uh, predominantly economic, social, and cultural rights, or ESC rights, um, that are linked to clean energy and a clean environment. And so obviously the hydroelectric project, as they take place all over the world, they are very much associated with a greener form of energy and something that is more sustainable. Um, but that sustainability doesn't come without cost. It doesn't come without thinking through how this might benefit the population. Um, as previous um, speakers have indicated, there's much more extensive framework and, um, and our, the researchers on this project have explained how uh, Brazil has a much more um, advanced um, energy infrastructure um, throughout its, um, its country and its territory um, compar in comparison to Paraguay. And so that's one thing that needs to be considered in, in the context of all about what I'm going to say, but also in the context of how they look at um, the financial distributions in the renegotiation, um, because obviously both countries would benefit from the continued access to inexpensive clean energy that has the potential to bring benefits to both populations. And I think both populations um, have high numbers of vulnerable populations, high numbers of indigenous populations that could undoubtedly benefit in many different ways um, from having better access to clean energy. Um, and I have gone back and looked at kind of trying to think, trying to review and see whether either country has made much of an effort to focus on the potential um, amazing relationship that could um, be in existence here in terms of transboundary um, transboundary approaches to green energy and how that actually could be beneficial for their populations. And so I, to do that, I looked back at their engagement with the human rights, um, different human rights treaty bodies in terms of their periodic reporting and discovered that both make some allusions to uh, green energy and access to energy, um, but they don't spend that much 
much time focusing on the positive steps that this project particularly has had, the Aotearoa Food Dam um, project, and how that actually provides both countries with an uh, with access or, or potential access in, in, in the terms of Paraguay to a sustainable um, energy source that could help with uh, raising up the rights provision for um, the population at large. And in this context, really how it's come across and the only hints that have come across um, but are ones that I think are worth pursuing um, for anyone interested in um, other ways to argue about um, uh, taking forward this uh, treaty negotiation is that um, in the context of the uh, covenant on economic, social and cultural rights, um, the right to health, the right to food, um, those both are very um, closely linked to sanitation, um, to uh, food, uh, food systems and food distribution and the development of uh, sustainable food practices. Um, and all in all of those instances, um, clean water and clean energy have a very close relationship. And so it seems that for the greater good and something that is widely recognized, the right to clean water um, and its association with supporting a wide array of other human rights, that this is one way that both countries could work together to bring a positive benefit um, with any of the surplus funds if they could actually come through with a uh, way to prioritize ensuring that both have that both countries have equitable distribution of um, the funds that could be generated um, through the renegotiation of Annex C. And I think importantly that this also is one way in which they could set um, a set the global compass um, in a positive light in terms of them working together. So instead of focusing so much on um, you know, energy justice and um, getting reparations for past injustices, I think this is a great opportunity to recognize that those might have occurred, but to take a positive approach to going forward because all the fighting and skirmishing about what could have been um, had things been different 40 years ago isn't going to change the realities for the people in either populations today. So I think that a really interesting kind of intellectual exercise is to see how to refocus and think about the global goods that could be produced and how that could set an example for other bilateral um, transboundary projects such as this. And I think that that speaks largely to um, the ways in which states are trying to traverse this uh, clean energy, protection against climate change, pr promotion of human rights, because regardless of whether human rights are viewed as a Western concept or a, a global concept, um, both of these countries and most countries around the world have signed on to this um, you know, extensive um, treaty network um, and, and system of accounting for human rights obligations. And so this is very much part and parcel of the international obligations that both Brazil and Paraguay owe uh, to their people, but also to the global community of states. I think it's also um, very interesting to note that the, in the inter-American system in particular, there has been an increased focus by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on um, the transboundary nature of harm. And so there's no reason why in the, in the context of environment and human rights. And so there's no reason why taking that negative approach to a transboundary project and where it might cause harm might can't be flipped on its head. I mean, like, as I say, for the intellectual exercise here, um, that, it, that instead of it being a negative exercise, you could look at the positive dimensions of what could be a transboundary relationship that causes many positive benefits that exceed just those that are economic in the context of both countries, but where economics play a massive role in ensuring a positive benefit. Um, and so I think I've spoken for my 10 minutes. Um, so I don't want to, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this. And I think questions are probably a better format for addressing these. But I mean, I think the work that Cecilia has done has set up a very good um, platform for discussing and it fits very nicely into the observatory of the, the ITA uh, project and renegotiation that we have been working on for the past few months here at Edinburgh and with our partners um, in Brazil and Paraguay. So I will now pass over to Veronica. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, Casey. I thank you very much to, to all our colleagues. And uh, I thank Cecilia for sharing your fascinating research. I had a few points. Um, I am a senior lecturer in private international law, and I come uh, to the sustainable development goals, particularly to the United Nations 2030 agenda on sustainable development goals from the private international law perspective. So you have a, a, a hint of, of, of how how I approach uh, the SDGs. But in relation to um, this project, um, I have three points to make as, as comments uh, in relation to Cecilia's research, but now after uh, the uh, very inspiring comments of my colleagues, I have many more. So I'll try to be succinct in relation to all of them, but also touch upon two points that have been made uh, in relation to particularly integration in South America and solidarity that are very close to my heart and not only to my research. So I will take the opportunity to comment upon that as well. So. Um, my three points or my original three points related very much to the idea of sustainability as core to the understanding of development, which is the central message of the 2030 agenda, but that coupling between sustainability and development as central to uh, the whole framing um, of, of, of this scenario. And I think in that sense, the way that Cecilia has thought about energy justice in that wider framework uh, very much um, so, um, embraces uh, that uh, context and that considerations there. So in relation to that, I will focus on article on, on SDG 7, which is specifically about clean and affordable energy, having that dual um, dimension worded in terms of sustainability and, 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 um, and development in terms of clean and affordable. And also SDG 12, which is the one that relates to responsible consumption and responsible production. Responsible consumption and production is something that has been touched upon in Cecilia's work, particularly in relation to uh, the use of energy by Paraguayans and the fact that um, there is scope for doing more, but it's very important that that doing more, it is done in a sustainable way, in a responsible way. And I think that consideration of SDG 12 is also important in that context. So that's sustainability and development, my first point. My second point is key to the agenda and is very much something that Cecilia has also referred to in her work, in her published work, of the importance of education. Education for development, but also education for the goal. So edu education for sustainability. And the third point, uh, it relates to the importance of conceptualizing and internalizing decentralized governance models as key to, to a forward-looking approach to the negotiation. So something that um, relates to that uh, two approaches and connects to uh, the concept of sovereignty that Anna Maria was referring to is very much that when we think about sovereignty, we tend to think about the state and the role of the state. And we very much frame the thinking um, that way. We're internalizing the agenda, the 2030 agenda, as part of the thinking or the forward-looking thinking in relation to this enables us all as participants. And, and what I said is that um, the agenda is very much about leaving no one behind, and in that sense connected to solidarity, but very much empowering civil society, private actors, and, and everyone uh, in relation to these processes. And in a way, we, we get empowered, but we also become responsible of those processes as well. So I think, and what is happening in part in terms of the engagement of civil society is something that actually talks about that conceptualization of decentralized processes and the importance of engaging with them. And I think that is indeed a very positive aspect of, of these processes. So um, 
in relation to the first one, uh, going into um, the SDGs that I mentioned, SDG 7 and SDG 12. SDG 7 is very much relates to clean and affordable energy. And it has uh, connects very much to that concept of green energy that Casey was referring to before. But in terms of what are the, um, the targets uh, identified as such in SDG 7 as meaningful ways of obtaining that uh, clean and affordable energy, 7B very much talks about expand infrastructure and upgrade technology for supplying modern and sustainable energy services for all in developing countries, in particularly least developed countries. So the idea of energy services for all is central to the implementation of SDG 7. And this is something that connects to the work of Cecilia and to that, the importance of um, affordable energy services for the population. Cecilia has mentioned the fact that Paraguay, in comparison to other countries that produce that number of clean energy, is very low in terms of its consumption. And this idea of framing this uh, possibility of, of, of further use within borders is something that is uh, very much on the table in terms of thinking forward or the forward thinking in relation to this. And that's where um, the importance of SDG 12 and responsible consumption and production, I think, come into my thinking. When I think about development and where we think about development or the way we used to think about development, it was very much connected to economic development. And it is um, very much the case that the Millennium Goals first, but now the Sustainable Development Agenda focuses not only on development, but on development as sustainability. And it is very important, particularly for developing countries. And I am originally from Uruguay. I actually very, um, very much involved in the development of kind of our countries in South America. Uh, is try not to repeat the experiences in some countries of the global north in terms of developing without consideration of sustainability and then try to tweak things in order to make it look sustainable. So I think it's very important to, and that's why I was thinking on the second point on education for the goals, how to achieve greater economic development, having sustainability as a core consideration at all times when thinking about uh, opportunities for development. So I think, of course, this is a great opportunity for development for Paraguay, for Brazil, for the region, and ultimately for the world. It is the biggest um, uh, hydroelectric power generator that can we can all actually benefit from. But in terms of thinking about development opportunities, having a sustainability a consideration at core, I think is, is key. So education for the goal is crucial for that. But that other concepts uh, that I do, I do want to leave time for questions. So I'm going quite fast at the moment and uh, sorry for that. Um, but I wanted to touch upon the last two points uh, that I mentioned that raised from the question of Cecilia in relation to integration, which is a question that Cecilia posed, but then Julia also referred to when she talked about Mercosur. And I have to say, uh, my first, my first uh, postgraduate degree in the 90s was about the law of Mercosur as a law of integration. So I have had been uh, involved with the law of Mercosur uh, since its very inception 30 years ago. And it is true that it is, in that sense, uh, um, an established integration framework. It is also true that what Cecilia says, that in terms it has not really harnessed uh, opportunities in terms of uh, distributive um, mechanisms, if you want to put it like that. So I think there is, there is a big um, platform there. There's an important platform there, but I think we, we use kind of 
ought to engage more with that. And I, I would like to hear from uh, colleagues in terms of what you think the, the avenues for further engagement uh, at an integration uh, uh, level uh, in South America is, and uh, thinking about that. And that very much relates to that um, solidarity mention of Ana Maria. And I think I've also been thinking about solidarity, particularly in the context of private international law and a humanistic paradigm for private international law. And I think what is happening in the context of the COVID-19 crisis has actually prompted prompted us all to uh, to think about international law more broadly in terms of cooperation and thinking about cooperation in terms of solidarity. So I, I very much uh, click with that thinking. And I think um, all these um, enlarging the cake, which is, as Ana Maria knows, a concept or an idea that I have been uh, talking about since we um, started in this project, is, is very much about leaving no one behind as well as uh, generating um, a win-win solution between Brazil and Paraguay. So when we uh, think about that in wider terms, it's not only possible to have by, uh, by considering this wider framework and win-win solution, but also a solution that engages with the uh, global uh, crisis that we are living in, and in that way um, engages very much with solidarity or global solidarity as a concept at its core. I have also exceeded my uh, my 10 minutes now or on the dot of my 10 minutes, uh, but uh, I want to congratulate my colleagues because I think it's been a fantastic ex learning experience for us all. And I've been very fortunate to learn a lot uh, from your research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vero. I think definitely that having this experience of working in discipline, interdisciplinary shows you know, the way in which each mind thinks about a problem and approaches it. And I think these concepts that sovereignty and justice and all that, that can be addressed from all these perspectives are quite helpful to, to your work. I'm going to abuse my, my position as a chair for one minute, but there is one thing else that needs to be in, in, in included here to close the circle. And I think it's become clear now that Talking about development, talking about um, energy, um, energy development or development through energy, human rights, sustainability brings one extra notion issue that is super important here and is foreign investment. And it's something that Paraguay that it appears very much and very repeatedly in the literature. And it's something that haven't been much discussed. I mean, I, I, I would be very interesting because my, my focus of area is precisely international economic law investment and arbitration. But it would be interesting to see whether Paraguay is part, is an active part of the current discussions of UNCITRAL Group 3 on the, on the reform of ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement. What is the, the current, uh, the, the version of the bilateral investment treaties that Paraguay might have concluded with other countries? You know, at the moment, there has been a backlash against the old generation of bilateral investment treaties to be overprotective. And especially in the context of starting a new, um, a new business, a new way of generating electricity, for instance, there will be issues of the right to regulate, also falling under the, the, the label of sovereignty. And I think this is something that you should also consider or perhaps something that we group should consider as part of our, of our research agenda. But I think it's very important to understand where is Paraguay at the moment with the obligations and the bilateral investment treaties, who are the prospective investors, what are they going to invest on, and how much Paraguay will need to adapt, adapt the regulation and eventually affect or reduce uh, the benefits that investors may be expecting. So, I just wanted to close, I think this closes the circle and goes back to sovereignty, but I think it also touches up on all the other issues that have been discussed by Julia, Cecilia, Veronica and Casey. So if I may now, I will open the, the, the floor. Cecilia, I don't know if you would like to answer first to some of these uh, reactions and then anyone can, can please uh, post a question. We can have a, a discussion. We'll have a lot of time, but we can still do it. Thank you. 
So I, I just like to say that I'm I'm extremely um, grateful for your comments, and and I think they are really enriching not only for my work, um, but 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 for the debate at large in Paraguay. And I will do my best to um to to carry to carry some of these key topics that you raised to the work, and then potentially um to 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 fuel the debate here internally. So just to to thank you, and I hope I, I get to to discuss more deeply with you. In other at uh, another point in time, because I'm I'm really eager to to hear about what the questions from the public might be to you and and to me about about my work. So so just wanted to close on that note. So can you please, whoever has a question, can you raise your hand, use the use the, the chat or the, the reactions or something to 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 raise your hand or post questions. But I think it's better if if we have a more uh, active um, interactive. Um, participation. So I will start with um, Ivo, is it? Oh, Ricardo, sorry. And then, and then Noel. Ricardo, please. Uh, can you present? Hola, me escuchan? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay. Uh, first, I want to congratulate to Cecilia. Uh, for me, it's the first time that I'm learning about uh, the treatment of uh, Itaipu and all of about this project because I'm, I'm from Bolivia but I'm so nice. but I'm working in Paraguay since half a year ago uh, one and a half year ago so in the context and uh, in the experience of Bolivia uh, uh, Sailing the gas to Brazil and Argentina is very different the situation that we are uh, having here in Paraguay and Brazil. So, for uh, make my question, uh, I need to know two 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 information or two data about. Uh, that maybe Cecilia can can explain to me first. Um, this treatment it was signed in 1973. Correctly. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, and the the the, the principal uh, access of the of the contract is uh, uh, sending sending the electricity to Brazil. Um, no, um, no. I mean, if you, I mean, can I, I can answer to each question, or, or if you, if you have something else, but I, I can, I can reply to that. Um, no, it, it isn't. It is, it is to generate energy for both countries on a 50-50 basis. Okay. Okay. Uh, the 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 Itaipu uh, um, dam uh, generates energy for for both countries. Yes. 50-50. Yes. And Paraguay cannot cannot sell the the energy to nobody. Um, for, uh, neither Brazil nor Paraguay, um, under the current interpretation, um, have okay. have uh, have presented any offers to do so to third parties yet. Um, so it hasn't it hasn't been been attempted formally. Um, because uh, first of all, because there's a market in Brazil that 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 is ready to to absorb all of, all of that energy, and then and also because there aren't many routes to to effectively do that um, from Itaipu yet. But that's the one of the key ideas I present is that an integration perspective, which is already underway, um, might be really useful. And in that sense, that option might be might be might be soon around the corner, uh, effectively uh, put in place. Okay. So with this information that you, you explained to me, uh, uh, my question is uh, uh, talking about money because this negotiation will be talk, talk about money. I understand, I understand the, the context of the, of the uh, uh, energy for the development and, and the <clears throat> Wait a moment, please. And the, 
uh, another the another act the another x is hydroelectric sover sovereignty the position of of paraguay talking about money is uh, say say to brazil say to brazil keep me keep me use my ex my my 50 excedent my 50 percent of for 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 my internal use and for my my possibility of sell the uh, the energy to the another countries so so paraguay can i mean paraguay hasn't any barriers to using its 50 percent share it just it just hasn't developed the sufficient capacities yet to absorb all, all of that energy um and uh, paraguay has engaged before in talks with neighboring countries to sell surplus of its hydropower because it has other two plants, um, but there haven't been any concrete offers or any concrete dealings yet with Brazil or with Argentina or even with Chile or Uruguay in the past. But these are both possibilities that are uh, in, Paraguay's, um, in Paraguay's realm of action. It just hasn't been exercised yet. Thank you, Cecilia. Sorry, I'm just going to allow uh, someone else now to ask a question so we can cover more. Uh, Noel, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So first of all, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Noel Jimenez. I'm one of the research assistants in this project that Anna mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. So my question is for Cecilia based on something that Julia mentioned a couple of minutes ago, and it's about uh, Julia was talking about the disadvantages of Paraguay during uh, the original treaty of Itaipu, the original signing of the treaty of Itaipu, and if those disadvantages have changed in the past few years before the 2023 revision, right? And what worries me, Cecilia, is the following, that we are talking, you are talking that integration is one of the solutions towards uh, the future of Paraguay after 2023, but my interpretation which may be wrong, is that the Treaty of the, the Treaty of Itaipu is already a small step into integration. And we lost a lot of sovereignty in that process, electric sovereignty. So how do we avoid making the same mistake after 2023 if we want to make changes to the to the treaty? How do we avoid falling into the same traps of giving giving too much um, of our sover sovereignty? That's basically my question. So thank you, Noel. I think um, your question is, uh, is is one that resonates with a lot of with a lot of concerned um, parties also here, in both in Paraguay and in the region. So first, um, I think well, Paraguay has changed dramatically in the last years, and the, the asymmetries have certainly uh, you know um, have certainly gone down in the sense that, of course, Brazil is still half the continent, and Paraguay is still one of the smallest countries in, in the region. Um, but the capacities or the capabilities that Paraguay has developed. Are, are, are um, you know, have, have really soared. So we are in a different position now than we were before. Just basically in terms of, 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 of the resources that we, can, that we have access to as a country. So Paraguay has one of the best track records in terms of, of foreign investment as, as, as Anna was mentioning, or even in accessing um, financial resources, which before that wasn't the case. And also our development priorities have changed rather dramatically from the 70s to now. So it is a different situation. I wish I had more time to, to, to develop that, but I, I just unfortunately don't. Um, and the second point which you were mentioning, well, it really depends on what you, on what you, what, what you call uh, yielding or relinquishing sovereignty. For me personally, and also hearing um, the experts in the matter, I, I, I do not quite agree with the contention that it, um, it meant any loss of sovereignty or any relinquishing of, of sovereignty by the signing of the treaty. But, um, and I think that, um, that the way to, um, uh, I mean, enlarging the cake, as, as Veronica just said, would actually empower the country to have more sovereign uh, control over its resources and over the benefits and, and how it interacts with the partners because we're stuck with our neighbors forever. So we are not, we're not able to, to put wheels under the country and take it somewhere else. So the only way to, to create more benefits and the only way to, to thrive as a country and as a region is to open up and 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 strive for for uh, for deeper and wider integration strategies, in my view, and I think that is the way to um, to even uh, opening up the conversation be beyond national sovereignty and 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 creating 
um, you know, uh, an integrated uh, approach to creating welfare for all of the countries involved. So that is my personal take on that. I hope it might re it, it might be useful for, for your question, but I can gladly, um, we can gladly engage in more discussions if you, if you contact me directly. Thank you, Noel, and thank you, Ricardo, too. Thank you. Um, please feel free to also post your questions in Spanish. I think we can accept two more questions before we close the, the webinar, if that is okay. Um, we are over time, but I think it's worth it. And uh, yeah, English or Spanish, uh, we have Ritzi here. It's a fantastic translator. Thank you very much for, for helping us today. So, um, I have a long one here. Uh, Helen Combes says, I would be curious to hear about the consultant process of uh, the consultation process, sorry, of Paraguay regarding the surplus, especially with uh, residents who could benefit from the energy. Generally speaking, it may be difficult to create the transmission network needed because of the location of the, of the plant. I would think that it may be more advantageous uh, to sell the surplus and reinvest the small distribution networks linked to other forms of green energy generation. Cecilia, would you like to address that question? Or That, that is a great point. Um, that is indeed a great point. And uh, um, actually it's, uh, I mean, I know the consultations for some of the stretches of the transmission lines are, are on the way. Um, so just to touch upon that point, but the main routes, so to say, um, are already in operation. So, um, uh, but, 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 it, but it is a, an interesting point, but just to, to give you an, an, an overview of what it looks like here in terms of distributed energy. Um, so the, um, we, we, have a, we have a really, we have a really classic system uh, to not call it outdated, where um, uh, the rules for the energy market haven't, haven't changed in the sixties. So we do not have the chance yet to invest massively from the private sector perspective in the, in, in distributed generation. So one way to, to overcome, of course, um, some of the discussions about um, how to bring the, the power to the demand centers is of course to, to go down, down, down that route, right? To um, have gener and distributed generation. Um, and we are working towards that. There is a law that was enacted in 2006 that, that tried to, to put an end to that, um, to that centralized model of, of energy generation in Paraguay. But um, now 15 years later, not one single project has been has entered into operation. This will change in the future. Um, actually, the public utility has presented its investment plan plan for the next years, 10 years, and there is um, a lot of, of uh, and there are a lot of projects which are um, which are going down that route that you mentioned. So that, that is indeed in the foreseeable future, and let's see how that interplays with with the large hydropower plants which we already have. So thanks for the question. Thank you, Cecilia. Is there one last question before we close? Um, I can't see the person. Please, can you unmute yourself? Oh, Noel. Yeah, sorry, it's me again. It's just <laughs> a little question for Cecilia. Uh, so two weeks ago, I attended this, it was another webinar, and Ricardo Canese was talking about an important Paraguayan figure on the matter of Itaipu, an important critic. And he, and he talked about sovereignty as well, but he said something that I disagree with, and I wanted to know your perspective on that. He said that Paraguay, that, that the energy of Itaipu is confiscated by Brazil under the current use of the treaty. And I think that word is wrong, confiscation, because I don't think it's a confiscation. So I wanted to know your perspective on that. That's, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Noel. So first of all, I respect uh, Mr. Canese's and, uh, and, and Mercedes Canese's, uh, which is his daughter, views very much because they have a long history of working towards making the, the nitty gritty of Itaipu Treaty accessible to a wider public. Um, and I also agree with you. I, I'm, I think that it's, a, that it's a rather strong word and it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really relate to what, what the situation is. Um, in the sense that, I mean, neither Brazil nor Paraguay are, um, um, are, are exercising any, any confiscatory uh, powers over energy. It's just a matter of who, who buys, uh, who contracts the power. And at this stage, um, um, uh, what, uh, what Electrobras does, it, it, it just, it just uh, goes ahead and, and contracts power just as, um, just as Paraguay does. So um, I understand this, this, this contention 
um, is formulated um, uh, also with the with the aim to um, to call the attention towards his 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 main point, which remains um, the 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 historic um, the historic um, need to be able to um, talk about the probability of, of, of making the energy available for Paraguay to sell it to um, to other countries or to the Brazilian market and market prices. So I I, I go I, I I take the liberty to to think that this word is used deliberately in a way to call the attention to the situation, but I don't think he um, actually might agree also with the fact that it's confiscated, which is which relates to another which relates to two other facts directly. So that is my take on that. As I said, I respect him very much, and I, I know I know his his work is is also important in this in this in this context. Right. I, right, I thank you. One more question. Sorry, sorry, Noel. Thank you, Cecilia. There is one last, and with this we finish. I think it's it's an interesting question, Cecilia. If you had to nominate a domestic multidisciplinary group to negotiate, who or which backgrounds will you include? Well, um, I think. Um, that has already been done for me, so to say, in a way that um, I mean there are I mean surprisingly I mean there are um, some 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 very steady steps have already been taken by the by the government in establishing a nice and well put together structure to approach the negotiation. And actually, um, I was very lucky to be invited as part of Academia to take part in one of these in one of these groups. I was part of the of the advisory committee to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs two years ago. And there, um, one of the proposals that followed from our discussions there, which included more than 30 people from different backgrounds, was actually to propose a multidisciplinary team um, to allow to, to, to study this topic. So there is a, a team which already we was formed after that, after those those um, suggestions that we made to the to the executive power. And that was composed of over 60 people, if I'm not mistaken, who are looking at economic aspects, um, legal aspects, technical aspects, and also um, matters pertaining to international relations. So I think that job has already been um, done. Uh, and, but, and if you ask me, I think that was the correct way to go. I hope that answers your question. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone being here. Um, um, I think we, we, had a, we had really a, a great experience learning about Itaipu. Um, we definitely are looking, um, the group of, of, of the Itaipu Treaty is looking to find avenues for new research uh, and new funding to continue to work close to you. Definitely, we have seen so many people in Paraguay and in Brazil, but especially in Paraguay, speaking about Itaipu from the financial perspective, from the legal perspective, from the human rights perspective, anthropology perspective, and, and everything. So it's definitely something that we will pursue. Uh, this this uh, recording will be um, will be available soon in the in the observatory. We are also going to share the link very soon when we finish the the, the format in the the observatory. But Cecilia, thank you so much. I hope we get to to work together in the future. And uh, please. Um, contact us if you if you have any more information if you want to share papers or or have more discussion so thank you very much everyone and and all the discussions greasy for translating cecilia for your insights have a very nice afternoon and morning everyone thank you.